Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Public Health Under Threat, an Examination of State Laws Protecting Public Health Officials from Harassment, brought to you by the Network for Public Health Law. I'm Charles Strong, the Senior Digital Marketing Coordinator at the Network's National Office, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. And a quick note that uh, both the presentation slides and video playback for this webinar will be available on our website shortly after the conclusion of today's event. Uh, we strongly encourage attendee participation, so feel free to submit questions at any time during this webinar by using the Q&A tab on the right-hand side of your screen. All you need to do is click on that tab, select all panelists, um, and send us your question. We'll be addressing them towards the end of today's webinar. Your moderator for today's webinar is Kathy Hoke. Kathy is the director of the network's Eastern Region Office and a professor and director of the Legal Resource Center for Public Health Policy at the University of Maryland Carey School of Law. She will be leading us through the rest of today's webinar. So, Kathy, over to you. Thank you, Charles, and thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon or this morning, uh, depending on where you're chiming in. Before I introduce our panelists, I just want to um, situate us for what we're going to talk about today. Um, many of us um, open the, you know, the news, whether it's a real newspaper or online over the course of the last 15 months to read really disheartening stories um, about um, threats against public health officials um, and others who were, you know, acting in the public health space during the pandemic. Um, but just to situate us and remind us of some of those, you know, at the federal level, probably the one most folks have heard about um, is with Dr. Anthony Fauci, right? Um, not only did Dr. Anthony Fauci suffer online attacks where people were calling him names and making memes about him, etc., but his he, he was actually, you know, he received personal threats. He had to have a security detail assigned to him. And, and more, moreover, his wife and his adult children received threats through their telephones, meaning folks went through the, the trouble of finding them um, uh, through their telephones and, and made threats against them. And so that's probably the one we, we all heard about um, at the very least. At the state level, maybe we also all heard about um, Governor um, Gretchen Wilmer in uh, Michigan. Uh, right, so at acting with her public health um, powers as um, the governor, she was enforcing mask mandates and other provisions. Um, and throughout this time, um, she was harassed and threatened. And in fact, um, there was a plot to kidnap her. Um, that you know, whether it was you know obviously not executed, but just knowing that that was happening obviously played a role um, in how Ms. Wilmer was able to respond to this. Whitmer, sorry, was able to respond to the situation. Then we can look um, at the state level at a public health official, Dr. Amy Acton um, in Ohio. Again, maybe maybe folks heard about um, what happened with her receiving repeated, you know, death threats and other threats against her. There was um, protesting in her community outside of her home. There were um, images of her hung in effigy, um, threatening her for acting in her public health capacity, ultimately leading her to her resignation and difficulties for Ohio in finding um, a replacement for her. And then we can look at the local level, um, Santa Cruz, California, for example, where um, the, uh, Dr. Gail Newell, um, who is the health officer um, in, in Santa Cruz, received harassment in the form of weekly protests at her home, demanding her arrest for the decisions that she was making uh, during the pandemic. During one town hall meeting, someone did rush the sage in an attempt um, to reach to her, and she just, during the course of this, received threats against her person. Um, and so uh, while uh, these were images that we saw on the screen, these were real people living through these experiences. And if you just multiply it by folks who've been working in public health uh, during the pandemic, you know the problem is um, quite acute. So that's what we're gonna talk about today, and we're super lucky um, to have a great panel um, of folks to talk with us about it. So next slide, Charles. Um, first, we're going to hear from um, Beth Resnick. Uh, Dr. Resnick is a senior scientist at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health in the Department of Health Policy and Management. She's Assistant Dean for Public Health Practice and Training and Director of the MSPH Program in Health Policy. Her research and practice interests include assessing and improving the public health infrastructure, enhancing knowledge of potential environmental and health connections, and developing effective public health policies. Beth's gonna to speak to us about work that she and her colleagues and others um, collaboratively have been working on to really bring voice to the public health professionals who have been under attack um, and 
forward looking um, what we can do um, from a policy perspective to prevent um, and protect in the future. Then we will hear from Brooke Thornton. Um, Brooke is uh, one of mine. So Brooke is a senior staff attorney for the network's uh, public health uh, for the network for public health laws eastern region. She is also the deputy director of the Legal Resource Center for Public Health Policy. At the Legal Resource Center, Brooke develops toolkits and policy papers on specific issues, drafts legislation, conducts in-person and virtual training sessions for public health professionals, and generally supports the development of public health law. She has been working um, closely on tracking. Uh, the legislation that has been introduced that's designed to protect public health officials and looking at existing laws. How can they be used um, to better protect public health officials um, and other public officials um, in these sorts of circumstances? So we're happy to have Brooke with us. And then we will hear um, a little Q&A with Brooke and Dr. Uh, Mina Brewster, who is the health officer for St. Mary's County, Maryland, one of our colleagues. Brooke and I work with Mina all of the time. Um, she is one of our favorite favorite health officers don't tell the other uh, 23, um, but we love working with, uh, with Dr. Brewster and the folks in St. Mary's County. Um, Dr. Brewster has directed the local health department in St. Mary's County, Maryland since 2012. Um, prior to that, she served as the medical director for the Health and Human Services Commission at the Indiana State Department of Health and as the chronic disease director for Indiana, overseeing a variety of efforts to address statewide public health concerns. She has a strong interest in the role of primary care, chronic disease prevention and control, and evidence-based public health action. So we're um, excited to hear from uh, Dr. Brewster later today. So on that note, I'm going to th turn things over to Beth. Take it away. Great, thank you so much, Kathy. Um, and thanks everyone, great to be here today to um, talk about this very important um, topic and make sure that we really understand it. Um, as Kathy was saying, we'd all been hearing lots about different incidents and public health officials under threats and attacks. Um, and so we really decided that this was important and we wanted to really unpack what was going on and understand it better. And also then, uh, which we'll be talking about more at the end, pivoting to what can we do about this to prevent it or deter it um, as we go forward. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here and sh uh, share some of our research. Um, what we did um, at Johns Hopkins, our team here, we looked, we did a media analysis, and we also partnered with NACHO, the National Association of County and City Health Officials, to do a survey of um, all local health departments about their own experiences around threats and harassments um, and departures and also um, changes in authority in the health department. Um, so this, the, what I'm going to be showing you, um, summarizes our findings from the media analysis as well as the survey um, and also just talking, doing some, um, interviews and general checking in with um, public health practitioners uh, about what they have been experiencing. So as Kathy said already, it's been a very challenging, actually probably a year and a half now. Um, and I think what's been particularly challenging and these some of these headlines would capture this is that it, it continues to keep changing. So, you know, initially the challenge of not knowing what was going on and again, our, our own um, workforce at risk of getting COVID and getting sick and dying and um, then the vaccines and what was happening with vaccines. So um, as I, I kind of, if any of you have had children, I've kind of characterized this last year and a half as almost like having an infant. Every three months we're in sort of a new stage um, and you've got to put up the baby gates, take down the baby gates, change the things, you know, so it's really been challenging um, on top of all of the, uh, let alone with the stress of the threats or the harassment. Um, so, and again, we're not out of the woods yet. It's continuing, right? As we're as we're trying to figure this out. And again, I think that's an important point of this talk. It's not just to highlight what happened, but also thinking about going forward, how we can better prepare and protect um, and support our, our workforce here, because this is really important. So let's just start with um, some of the key things that I think the media has focused in on the departures and the harassments and threats. So this is a map of um, the departures of um, state and local public health leaders. Again, it's March 2020 through January 2021 um, was the timing of our media analysis and surveys. And what we found is, as you can see, pictorial here, it's across the country. It's not only in one place. Um, and it's really a mix. Uh, this is a media analysis. So again, this is probably an under reporting of the total numbers. But it's a mix of things, and um, Kathy talked about some high level uh, firings or departures, but a lot of these were also, which again, I think going forward, we need to be 
cognizant resignations, retirements, um, or other reasons for leaving. So, yes, there were some firings, but um, our count that we have is um, about 220 um, departures in this time period. So, in addition to the departures, as we were starting to talk about, this is the harassment and threats. Now, this map, obviously, you can see are less dots than the, the first one. This was through the media analysis, and most of the media was um, focusing in on people that had let or were fired or left. Um, and so this shows you which ones also had harassment as part of their um, of their departure. So, but in our survey, we ended up most uh, we got about 583 responses and about 61% of the survey respondents from the NATO survey reported that they had experienced some form of harassment. Now, how, what do we mean by harassment? And I'm going to give you a little more details about this going forward, but. I want to be clear, it's not that everybody was having somebody um, coming to their yard and protesting. That, of course, did happen, but more in um, more high profile cases, and that's what the media had. But I think the most common thing was just negative messages and backlash around social media or general Internet posts, things um, about public health protection orders or things about the health department. Um, and then, of course, people got messages directly individually to them. That was probably the second most common thing. Um, so, again, there were some of the high profile things, but I think the important piece that I really wanted to highlight that you're not necessarily getting from the media and that I would like for us to really think about is the full story about what's happening to the people that aren't in the newspaper, but might just be doing their job. And, and another piece I wanted to highlight is the majority of them people that we are finding through our research, not through the media analysis are staying in their jobs. So they are committed and want to do, do their jobs, um, but that, and again, this is the important part of how can we move forward and make sure that we can protect them and give them the supports they need. So here's just some cute, uh, quotes that I think are, are really important and sort of underline some of these key themes that I'm just talking about. The lived experience, these are quotes from health professionals, either from the survey or were in the media um, articles. But this first one, I am sad, I am tired. There's an ugliness and cruelty in our national rhetoric that is reaching a fevered pitch here at home, and that should worry us all. So this sad and tired and worn out, right? And then our staff, and particularly our female staff, are met with hostility at a local level that we have never seen before. And frankly, it's not acceptable. They are doing their job. They're doing what we've asked them to do. And I think this is important when we think about going forward. How can these public health practitioners do their jobs and how can we support them? And then this last one, which I think we, um, Brooke is going to get more into in terms of um, political uh, complications and considerations. The, the political gamemanship has empowered some county supervisors to demand retraction of evidence-based public health guidance. It has encouraged and rewarded political allies to rail against science and data driven measures to protect our neighbors. It has emboldened others to think it is appropriate to treat public health professionals with disrespect and disdain when they are just trying to do their jobs with skill and grace. Uh, so, again, I, I want to highlight that this is what we want to think about how we can avoid this going forward. So some other key underlying factors that I think are important that has been here before COVID is this disinvestment in public health. When we think about disrespecting public health, thinking about uh, how we have thought about public health even before COVID happened. So this is a picture that shows the change in expenditures per resident from 2000 to 2018. So again, way before COVID um, arrived. And the coloring here, if you can see anything in brown or tan or is a, a deduction in funding over the 2010 to 2018 time period. And the ones in blue are the only ones that include an increase. So as you can see, majority of states across the country, there's been a disinvestment um, in the prior decade before we hit COVID. And this quote here, I think, again, is important. We don't say to the fire department, oh, I'm sorry, there were no fires last year, so we're going to take away 50% of your budget or 30%, sorry. Um, that would be crazy, right? But that's what we're doing with public health day in and day out. And in addition to the overall spending, the workforce. So already the we we're talking about departures, but we started behind the eight ball when um, there had already been a diminishing public health 
workforce again in the decade before, um, you know, since the Great Recession. People need to take a step back and take a deep breath and try to look at this from the health officers and the healthcare workers standpoint. We are all overworked, overwhelmed, exhausted mentally and physically. So again, in this graph here, you can see the reduction in the um, public health workforce throughout the decade. So we were already understaffed and then the pandemic hit. So um, again, being adequately prepared is something that is uh, really important and we need to think about. And then lastly, again, I don't think anyone's gonna be surprised at this when we think about our um, data systems and technology. And of course this became um, a big issue during COVID when you were hearing about lack of data systems and inability of equipment to be able to produce data, share data, disseminate it, um, and also the um, interoperability, right? Different states, different jurisdictions using different systems. Um, so again, our, our public health data systems are antiquated and in dire need of security upgrades. Paper records, phone calls, spreadsheets, and faxes requiring manual data entry are still in widespread use and have significant consequences, including delayed detection and response, lost time, missed opportunities, and lost lives. A perfect example of this is I work in a, with master's students. They are all looking for jobs. Some state health departments still have fax numbers to fax in your employment application. Um, you know, my students who are in their mid 20s don't even know what a fax machine is anymore and certainly don't have access to one. So again, this isn't only just about our data. It's it's um, system wide to be able to um, staff up and be able to function in today's society. The systems we have have to be updated. So as you can see on this graph here, this is from the um, NATO profile, um, a percent of um, the health departments that have uh, had different um, upgrades in technology. And again, there's a lot of work to be done here. So um, I'm going to close now with a quote here from a health officer saying, uh, we are all left scrambling at the local and state level to extract resources and improvise solutions in a fractured healthcare system in an under-resourced public health system. So um, I look forward to continuing this discussion at the end um, and really thinking about how we can um, advance and move forward and think about how we can um, correct these issues um, and support our workforce. So thank you. Um, and I'm gonna pass it off to Brooke. All right, thank you so much, Beth. Um, so I just, I just wanna start off um, and kind of set the stage here. So last summer um, and really last fall as well, the network, we were contacted many different technical assistance requests um, in reference to these rampant threats that, that Beth talked about that, that Kathy opened with um, that were received by public health officials nationwide. And they were really looking to get a sense of what measures um, could be taken uh, were there legal protections that that exist for these officials who are facing these threats and um, this potential of violence? And so as a result, um, we wanted to kind of comb through the state codes and see what we could find that already existed without reinventing the wheel that these officials may use um, in the 50 states and D.C. What already exists? What could they potentially um, rely on here? So that's how we became involved um, in, in this project initially. Whoops. Okay, so I just want to kind of provide an overview of, of what I'll get into here today. So the legal landscape, um, criminal offenses against public health officials. So there were many different directions we could have gone with this as far as looking to see what exists um, in the state codes. What we were looking for um, was whether there were criminal offenses that were already on the books in the states and whether or not this would provide sanctions against people who were making these threats um, and, and engaging in certain behaviors. So what we ultimately found was that there were four different types of categories um, as we kind of combed through and, and looked through and we conducted this 50 state survey. There are four different categories that these statutes fell into. And so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna summarize these statutes um, and show you what they look like and get into some of the detail of, of what they were. I'm then gonna move into how these can be utilized, these criminal statutes. Um, and what we did back in the fall was we created a fact sheet for each state that had such a statute. And that includes some information I'll go over when we get there. Um, and we also highlighted and created and published these template responses for each state. And the idea of these template responses was that, was that these could be used by public officials to either you know, post in response to an email 
or um, it, in response to maybe some kind of Facebook group or these harassing um, voicemails they might be receiving, that this was language that they, they could use just to put someone on notice that this could potentially be a crime, what, what they were doing. So we knew that as a result of everything that had gone on for the past year, that the 2021 um, legislative session, that the state uh, legislative bodies would likely be trying to find some type of solution to address this behavior, um, or maybe tweaking some of their existing statutes to see, see what they could do. Um, and so we tracked the state legislation in the, the bills nationwide, and I'm going to be addressing those um, with, with some level of detail toward the end of this presentation. Interestingly enough, most of the bills introduced, they didn't um, tweak or kind of address the statutes that, that I'm discussing here. They introduced a, a newer topic. Um, some states already have existing statutes on the books, but that's surrounding doxing, so preventing um, the public from posting personal information that is being posted for the sole purpose of harassing um, or, or for a malicious purpose or intent. So that's what the bills, that's what the response focused on rather than kind of changing some of the statutes that, that we initially um, studied and tracked. And so last, I'm going to get into a discussion um, with our St. Mary's County, Maryland health officer, uh, Dr. Brewster. And so I know she wouldn't have claimed to, to have experienced the types of threats and harassment that Kathy addressed earlier on. Um, she Her experience was more, more a little bit what Beth um, addressed, which was, you know, just making making the job, um, I guess I, I don't want to say unpleasant, but just these threats um, and, and harassment that were like thinly veiled. It wasn't exactly violent. It wasn't maybe interesting enough to the media to cover, but she was in that majority of, she was experiencing these situations, these issues, and they weren't necessarily getting um, the same type of coverage that we heard about a little earlier on. And then we're going to move back to Beth and Kathy and open it up uh, for discussion. Okay, so. The legal landscape. Oh, the legal landscape. Um, so the overview here of those criminal, the criminal statutes I was looking for initially, 35 states and DC, they have one of these criminal statutes. Um, 15 states do not. And so I've listed them here in green, those that do have a statute. Of those, um, all but but two states, and that was Louisiana and Oklahoma, all of them um, would apply to state and local officials. Um, so not just state, but the local, the political subdivisions of that state are, are covered, except for Louisiana, Oklahoma. There are other um, states that, that had statutes on their books that might apply to very specific types of officials, like um, law enforcement or judges, um, people in, in those roles, but they didn't apply to public health officials. So I'm not talking about those. Uh, I didn't include those states specifically. And then we have 15 states who do not have these types of statutes on their books explicitly. That's not to say that there's no um, crime that would be available to, to charge a person who is engaging in certain behavior, like maybe harassment or stalking, something else. But the statutes that I'm going to be getting into, um, these are very specific and a little different, different than those. Okay, so these criminal statutes. Um, there are four different types, like I mentioned, four different types of categories. The first, obstructing government operations and public administration. And so a person has to obstruct and really impair or impede um, the public official or the public servant's duties. The second one, threatening, harassing, or intimidating public officials or public servants. Um, just like what, what it sounds, it doesn't necessarily have to have impeded or, or thwarted the um, the role or the, the job of the public health official, but just the fact that they were a public health official and that is why this conduct was taking place. That's what matters for to satisfy the elements of this statute. Third, uh, disturbing, disrupting, or interfering with the public officials or public servants um, and or the conduct of public business, uh, the discharge of their duties. Um, this is pretty broad and it generally would ap apply to like trespass or um, restricting freedom of movement on government owned property. And only a few states had this one. This was less common. And then the fourth, this is very, this is the only one that was specific to um, health officers, public health um, officials, and it's obstructing a person um, enforcing health law or a health officer in the performance of the duty. So it's very specific language um, and they are in the health codes of the few states that have these, and they just apply to health officials, um, health officers. 
Okay, so the terminology, um, this really matters here. And these are just some of the, the terms I really wanna focus on um, because depending on how these are defined in the states that had these statutes really governs whether or not the public health official um, is included in the definition and, and would receive any type of pr protection. So those few states I mentioned, Oklahoma and Louisiana, the way that government was defined um, specifically for, in per, for purposes of the title for those statutes, um, it wasn't broad enough to encompass uh, local officials. When we see things like municipality or political subdivision, that's how we know that the local um, actors are included as well. Government function, again, um, for the most part, most states it included this definition here that any activity which a public servant is legally authorized to undertake on behalf of government, that's generally broad enough that would encompass um, most activities that, that a public health official you know, would be um, doing in the, in the performance of their, their job. But there were a few states that had some alterations there as well. And then public servant or public official, there was quite a bit of um, variation there. And the, um, the, when it would include public health official, it was usually a broader type language, like any officer or any employee of government, whether elected or appointed. Um, sometimes it might just say a member of the um, executive branch who is elected. And so that might exclude you know, a health officer. So really depended um, state to state on, on who was included. And then some states, and I think we got a question about this before the webinar, some states would include current um, and former, and some would just include current. So it really differed um, state to state on that. Okay, so the first statute, a little a little more um, information on that. So obstructing government operations or public administration. As you can see, I've listed the states that I put into this bucket on um, this type of statute here at the bottom. It's the, the most common one that we've seen. And so the summary, you know, a person, this is the language we're seeing, a person must obstruct, impair, impede or hinder a, a public official um, or public servant's official duties. And they have to use intimidation, um, physical force, attempted, threatened, or actual violence. Um, and the impact of that is they had to have actually obstructed or impaired or impeded that official's um, duties. And so the problem here is, you know, these statutes are limited. And I just want to highlight, um, let's say there's an attempt to thwart operations, but it doesn't necessarily actually impact the government's operations. Um, then that really, it's creating an evidentiary, a potential evidentiary issue here. I mean, what constitutes actually thwarting government operations and did they, did they meet that standard? Um, if a health official is unable, let's say, to spend as much time, you know, working on something because they have to meet with a security detail, let's say, for example, does that thwart government operations? I think it's a, it might be a little bit of a stretch there in some cases. So there's certainly an evidentiary issue. This certainly does provide, um, there's some, some limitations here. And so then here's just an example of, I pulled together some of the stronger elements from different states, and this is what I would almost call a model statute of what it might look like um, here. So if you know, you're know you someone who is interested in just language, what it could look like in your state, this is just an example of, um, of what we've seen. All right, so enforcement. I just wanna talk about this. I believe we had a question about this as well um, prior to the webinar. These types of statutes, they're more commonly misdemeanors than they are felonies. And as far as incarceration, there was quite a range with the states who had these. So 30 days in jail to two years, most commonly it was about a year. And then the fines, I mean, a huge difference there as well, but most commonly we were seeing about $1,000. Um, from my research, and it doesn't mean they don't exist, but from what I could tell, if this has been used, it has not been used very often for the purpose that we're talking about. Um, there's some really, generally it was law enforcement and police officers, and then other kind of really unusual um, circumstances like a fishing and game officer, uh, a state school representative. I mean, things like that were like were less common, but I did not note public health officials. Um, it doesn't mean they weren't prosecuted successfully at the trial level, but it didn't from from the way that I am able to conduct my legal research. There were no trial or there were no um, opinions from a higher court that issued as a result um, of this specific charge. I wasn't able to find um, any. So it's not to say it can't be used, just to say if it has been used, I wasn't able to track it necessarily, and it hasn't been used very often. Okay, the next type of statute here, the threatening um, and harassing or intimidating public officials 
and public servants. So, so a summary here. So this is when um, a person is threatening, harassing, or intimidating a public official, public servant, public employee because of his or her employment um, with the purpose of influencing his or her position. So the action has to be the threat, the harassment, the intimidating, and those are going to be very specifically defined in the state's code. And the impact, um, it doesn't have to necessarily, in, it didn't have to necessarily um, influence the decision. It just had to have been an attempt with the purpose of influencing the decision. And then I've listed a handful of states and DC with this type of statute here. So um, I just want to say is that the limitation here, of course, is freedom of speech. Um, freedom of speech is not is not absolute. And so it would really need to be a careful analysis as to whether or not this crossed the line um, with freedom of speech. And so I just want to say that's going to be an issue um, anytime there's a threat that we're going to run into, especially when the claim here is, well, I was exercising you know, my right to um, express discontent with a mask mandate, something along those lines. So that's, that's going to be um, an issue for, for these statutes. Here I've included just language. I've pulled different parts um, of state state codes to show what a statute um, may look like. Enforcement. So these were actually more commonly um, felonies, and the incarceration. This was a rate. They're all quite a range: um, six months to ten years, but usually about a year incarceration. Fines. Again, this is a huge range, but we're seeing the increased. Um, penalty here as compared to the, the prior statute that I went over. And again, um, same thing, I'm not seeing that these have been used in this way. These statutes have been used to charge in this way. I was seeing um, situations, run-ins with maybe police officers or public defenders, um, district attorneys, corrections officers, judges, but I wasn't seeing this necessarily with public health officials specifically. The third type of statute. So disturbing, disrupting, or interfering uh, with public officials, public servants, and or the conduct of public business or discharge of duty. So here a person is interfering or disturbing or disrupting government administration in a government owned building. Um, and they have to, the action has to be that they've, they've restricted the freedom of movement to or from a premises um, and that they've impeded the performance of duties or proceedings and, and refused to leave these premises. Only a few states um, really had had this statute here. And so I just want to say, you know, another limitation here, another speech issue is there's the freedom of speech. We have the freedom um, of assembly. And if people are gathering out, gathering in a local health department to, let's say, protest a, a, a public health policy, um, it seems like a natural place to gather. But the line, of course, is crossed when folks are not able to enter the building, do their job, leave the building safely. I mean, that's where the line is. Um, but presumably, you could see kind of where some arguments might go for and against um, prosecution of, of a group of people. Um, so just another interesting point, another potential limitation that, that we would consider. And then here um, I included, this is a bit longer than the other ones, um, but these are some of the stronger provisions I saw in a few of these states, and I combine it into you know, what we would call this, this model um, policy. Here, these are most commonly misdemeanors. Um, the penalties, the incarceration, uh, potential time in jail was a little lower, six months to a year, and the fines were a little lower too, so 500 to 2,500. Um, and what I was seeing for case law, again, not seeing that these were used. Um, like I said, doesn't mean they weren't, um, just might mean it didn't go up on appeal to a higher court. and an opinion didn't issue and I wasn't able to track that. Um, but this happens more likely at like schools. There were a few cases, museums. Um, and I think it was in the context, context of, of protesting, generally speaking. All right, so the, the fourth bucket here, the fourth category, um, this is spot on for health officers, those engaging in public health duties. Um, a person obstructs or interferes with a health officer or person enforcing health laws or measures. So that's actually broader. Sometimes that authority could be delegated to law enforcement to enforce the health laws and measures. So this could apply to them in that situation as well. So um, the action here has to be that there was a target at a health officer or person charged with the enforcement of those measures. And it has to have actually um, obstructed or interfered with the person enforcing the health law measures. And four states had these statutes. 
Um, all right. So these statutes were fairly similar state to state, but I did include here, you know, for our purposes, um, this model statute and some of the other limitations that I discussed could potentially apply here as well. I think all of them probably would. Um, these are more commonly misdemeanors and nine, 90 days to one year, depending on the state that we were looking at and um, the fines 200 to, to 2000. There was some, the case law did involve police officers enforcing the health state, the state health codes. There were a few cases like that here, um, but not a health official. And, and that could just be perhaps the, the facts didn't present themselves. Um, like we've heard from Beth and, and some from Kathy, um, these are, this is a newer kind of time for us in public health. And so the threats, the behavior toward these public health officials, some of this is newer as well. Not to say it's never happened, but it's far less common, I think, um, until most recently that we're seeing and hearing this level um, and this number of, of threats. All right, so I just want to talk a little bit about, I mentioned there were these fact sheets that we created. These are available on the network's website. And this was to just give state officials a sense of, look, this is a statute that exists. You might want to look at it, just know it's there. It has the potential to apply. And we just laid out the statute text, the citations, the relevant definitions uh, that I addressed early on. So how that, what that looks like in your state, um, the penalties that I went over here, and then just, just a brief summary. Um, we also included this template response to violators in those fact sheets. And like I mentioned earlier, um, I think I have it here. Yes, this was an example. If you're from Maine, this is yours. And I list initially the, the, the citation so you can find it very easily. Um, what, what it prohibits, what action does it prohibit? And what's the description of the conduct that you want to address, you know, with this, this person through email or a voicemail that you're just referencing, you say the date, um, you know, what that specific conduct said, we included an example here. Um, and then, you know, if it's really extreme, you might put them on notice that you contacted law enforcement, uh, even, you know, and you can contact law enforcement when you know whenever you'd like even if it's not as extreme it doesn't mean it has to be extreme i just want to note that um but uh you also want to say in there perhaps something like we would report we may report this matter to law enforcement if, if you decided not to do that all right so i want to move into um the 2021 legislative session uh some of those bills now some states are just a few actually are still in session the vast majority have, have theirs during the first half of um, of the year, so most of those have wrapped up. But here, what I'm focusing on some state bills um, that have addressed protections for public health officials. So, not surprisingly, the bulk of these have focused on protecting th that doxing, the, the the publishing of personal information for officials. That's what we've seen, and it's no surprise because most of what we heard about is you know people go going to people's homes, finding their phone numbers, that type of thing. So this seems like a logical way to try to um, prevent people from encouraging those to go to someone's home, threaten them on the phone. It, it seems like a potential smart legislative solution. Um, I would also mention if you're from one of the states that I, I'm, I'm talking about, these bills may include other things as well, but I'm just focused on the narrow portion um, uh, that's relevant for today's discussion. And so I also just want you to keep in mind that these uh, bills, these laws, just because I'm talking about something that was introduced in one of these states, it doesn't mean it doesn't already exist somewhere um, in another state, but I'm focused on this legislative response uh, to the attacks on public health officials during this pandemic um, and during these states of emergency. So these are the ones that I've um, decided to highlight here today. The green passed, um, the red, these are failed or, or you know, they never got a hearing, they, they're dead. And so I'm just gonna walk through um, what what these did and let's start with Utah. So this is one that passed um, and it amended the public safety code to require that the Department of Public Safety in Utah provide for the security and the protection of public officials. And so here public officials is it's de defined very specifically. So it includes those who are um, elected to positions in the executive or they're appointed to or employed in the executive and engaged in policy making, drafting legislation, you know, making rules or par partaking in a, in a judicative um, decision. So these are um, these definitely have the potential to apply to a public health official. And so my read on this was that previously um, there wasn't the specific duty 
or, or obligation of that Department of Public Safety in Utah to provide this protection. Um, but it, it, it was it existed for certain certain officials likely, but these folks were added to the mix. And so it broadened that scope of protection. All right, Oklahoma. So this is another one that passed and this dealt with shielding um, open records. So public bodies shall keep confidential um, the personal information of, this is one that says current and former employees. And that includes home address, uh, home phone numbers, private email address, um, and, and private mobile phone numbers. So there was a previous statute um, and it did, it did address keeping some personal information private, but what the statute did was it added, to me this just looks like it was an update because it added um, mobile numbers and email addresses and looking at the legislative, the dates when this had passed, it, it seems to me like this was just technology updating itself. And I don't know for a fact, but I think it's possible that the impetus was there were these threats going on. All of this personal information was being released. Um, and this was just a way, you know, mobile phone numbers and the, and the personal email addresses. That was probably the most common way of contacting people. And I think it was a way to get at it. Um, I just also, I would add to, I know the focus of this webinar isn't um, what happened with the, the 2020 election, but there were serious, I mean, this is no surprise, serious, really frightening threats against local public um, uh, election officials. And I think that there was, um, you know, there's kind of a situation where we have health officials and public election officials too, that are facing some similar types of threats. Um, and so this might be a time when the state kind of considered protections that would apply to both. And I just do wonder if something like this um, had, had its roots in, in that concern. All right, Colorado. So this, um, this bill is passed and it makes it a criminal misdemeanor um, to disseminate personal information of public health workers if that dissemination poses an, an imminent and a serious threat um, to that official or the worker's safety or their families. So public health um, workers includes employees or contractors um, of the, the Department of Public Health and Environment engaged in public health duties, um, employees or contractors of a county or district public health agency, and, and then members of a county or district board of health. So the definition they use there is really specific to public health. Um, it doesn't include the elected uh, county commissioners. But previously, this wasn't an entirely new law. It was just amended to add public health workers. It only applied to um, law enforcement officials and their family members and victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking. So, of course, this was an important law. It did some good. Um, it also just now added public health officials. And Colorado is a state where we heard quite a bit um, nationwide. Their officials really got, um, really, there were some threatening and frightening behavior out there as well. So I would think that that would be a reason that the, the legislature considered this bill. All right, so Oregon. So this dealt with um, creating a civil cause of action this past for, for people where their personal information was shared online with that intent to harass, injure, humiliate. And here, um, personal information, there's a list of what it includes, home address, email address, personal number, social, um, contact information for employers, and then, you know, photographs of children um, and identification of schools that, that children attend. And this isn't just specific to um, public health officials. This applies to all persons. Um, and so, you know, the, the key for us, though, of course, is that because it applies to all persons, it would certainly apply to public health officials. All right, moving on to the bills that we saw that um, Maryland, and this is my, my home state, um, there was a bill introduced that would have criminally um, penalized those who knowingly or willfully make or send a threat to a public health official with the intent to intimidate, interfere with, or impede. Um, and this is specific to public health official only. And I just want to say this was introduced um, a little late in the game here in Maryland, and that may be why it didn't go anywhere. It's not that this was hotly debated and hotly contested. Um, this was kind of a just a very busy session, a very different session for most states. And my sense is that in Maryland, um, this was just introduced late and it could have been largely procedural, the reason that it didn't necessarily go anywhere. South Carolina. South Carolina is one of those 15 states I mentioned that doesn't have a law in its books. They did introduce one here, it's in red, it failed. Um, and this was a bill that would have made it a criminal offense to threaten or kill, 
<clears throat> or inflict bodily harm on a public official, um, public employee, or a member of their immediate families. And here, public employee and public official, they have very broad definitions, and so it would apply to both state and local officials. Um, and of course, the limitation here with this kind of bill, the statute, is that the conduct really has to be extreme um, for a person to be afforded this kind of protection and under the statute. And of course, we want to um, interfere before the conduct, conduct is extreme and causes harm to someone. The last bill that I will address here, um, Alabama. So what this would have done is it would have it failed, established doxing as a crime, um, and it would have penalized a person for publishing personal identifying information of a public servant um, with the intent to annoy, harass, or impede the duties of. And public servant here um, includes any officer or um, any employee of government. So very broad definition, um, but this one did not go anywhere either. And I will say this is something we're gonna continue to track. Um, unfortunately, I don't think this issue is going away and I'm curious to see if additional solutions, new ideas, and um, more states introduce similar bills, similar measures um, next year. And so with that, um, I want to now engage in a little Q and A uh, with, with Dr. Brewster. And so we don't have slides, this is kind of a format to, to hear a little bit about her experience, um, talk a little bit and uh, just kind of hear, hear from her perspective. Like Kathy said, we work with Dr. Brewster um, frequently in Maryland in our state here. And I just first want to thank her for her time. Um, this pandemic is, it's not over. Uh, the, she's still significantly busy with her regular health officer duties on top of what must be done to, to keep this pandemic under control. And, um, you know, like I said a little earlier, her experience it wasn't as dramatic necessarily as some of the, the stories we heard earlier on, but like Beth said, it was kind of the more um, common scenario, plaguing health officers, public health officials nationwide, just something else that they had to deal with um, while doing really important work. Um, we worked with, with Dr. Brewster a little bit during this time and provided some legal information since there isn't like a one statute, one catch all, but just to get creative and try to provide some solutions. And so, um, that is where we are uh, today. So I just I just want to allow Dr. Brewster, um, if she could just briefly describe her education her, and her work history prior to her role as um, health officer for St. Mary's. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for having me on and I appreciate the chance to talk. Um, and I'd also uh, really just want to say uh, kudos and um, you know, I'm here with you to all the uh, public healthers uh, that are on this call today. It's been an incredibly uh, challenging past year and a half, uh, but I think one of the uh, most important things coming out of this pandemic eventually uh, will be the relationships and the um, appreciation that we've built for each other in the field of public health and all of our different roles. So, um, my background, um, I'm a family physician. I have a background uh, as a family medicine physician. I'm also in sports medicine. And uh, I've uh, public health trained, did my master's in public health uh, before I went to med school, actually. And um, I've always really had a passion for public health. Uh, it's really what set me up to go into primary care as a physician. And uh, I made the transition into public health full time uh, about 15, maybe a little bit more uh, years ago. I was previously working in academic medicine where I was teaching residents and fellows and um, so forth. And then I um, transitioned to the state health department uh, where I was working, at, as described earlier in Indiana uh, for some years. And then um, I was approached about this job here uh, about nine years ago and uh, you know, really didn't have being a local health officer in my goal set. I know the responsibilities of local health officers from state to state and even from jurisdiction, jurisdiction to jurisdiction are quite different. Uh, but here in Maryland, uh, the system is uh, pretty uh, significantly dependent upon its local health department infrastructure. Uh, and so when I was approached about this job, I uh, kind of took the leap and, you know, I love it. I love uh, local public health um, and uh, I've been doing it now for about nine years as local health officer. I, I direct our uh, local health department here. All right, okay. great. Thank you. Um, so can you just getting into a little bit about um, your your time as health officer, 
during this pandemic. Can you describe um, your contact with, with members of the public uh, once the pandemic appeared and how it started, how it changed over time, and then a little bit about how that might have been different than before the pandemic hit last year? Yeah. Um, so, so clearly, I mean, just like with everyone else, COVID definitely changed how we interact. Uh, and um, so many things that we would have done in person previously, like community info sessions and town halls and, and those types of things, uh, you know, where partners invite you to speak to give information to their network, uh, which usually would have been done in person, of course, moved virtual. Um, I think, uh, you know, there, there was a lot more, though, for me as local health officer, probably in person uh, and in sight, I should say, um, as local health officer when the pandemic started. Uh, you know, I, I uh, am leading a department that is the lead partner uh, organization for us here locally uh, and, and coordinating the local response. So while our emergency operations center is activated and we work very, very closely with so many different support organizations here, um, our uh, role as local health department is the lead and primary role for uh, the COVID response. Um, you know, from managing a hotline to primary communications to the public, media requests, you know, all of that, uh, and uh, all the data analysis, the testing, vaccine, you know, contact tracing, all of that we do. Um, so, so we're quite uh, in the in the spotlight, I think, for this. Um, so, all of this requires uh, a lot of in-person presence uh, with our partners uh, and uh, you know, with our definitely with our uh, commissioners, our policymakers who serve as our board of health. Um, I did give publicly televised Board of Health meetings every couple weeks, um, and uh, we were constantly updating our website. I uh, spoke quite a bit uh, in person, even with partners when we were doing site visits to go through their COVID preparation protocols uh, and other uh, types of in-person uh, presence there as well. Um, so definitely more uh, in the spotlight than I think local public health has traditionally been. Um, and I think that's probably similar to the experience of, of most um, health officers in the state and, and probably around the country as well. So being more, um, more in the spotlight, um, did you receive negative comments, negative interactions? Um, what were your experiences like with members of the public? Yeah, so, you know, most, um, most of the public has been extraordinary um, throughout this whole thing. I mean, you know, from, from letters of support to encouraging emails and, and um, phone calls and um, editorials that were, you know, lauding the, the work of, of our health department and community partners. We even had, you know, campaigns organized to get us snacks and coffee um, on, a, on a regular basis. And, you know, when, when you're working uh, 20 hours a day, seven days a week, as we were for, for especially the first you know, couple months of this pandemic, uh, as we were building our surge uh, response, um, and even you know more recently, you know 12 to 15 hours a day, mostly seven days a week, and and that 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 type of positive response is a huge morale booster. Uh, and uh, you know I, I know our team um, has been really grateful for that. Um, but we did have some challenges. We had uh, you know a, a lot of you know people upset. I, I think about mandatory masking, uh, which was a state policy. I did issue a local policy on masking before the state issued its policy, uh, but uh, but the, it was soon, soon after my local uh, uh, issuance, the, the state uh, executive order came out. Uh, so it rescinded our local level order. Um, uh, or, you know, just uh, people upset who just didn't believe in COVID or they thought we were harming people by giving out vaccine, um, or they just didn't believe in public health. Uh, frankly, no matter what we did, you know, we, we were in the spotlight at a time when uh, people were looking for a spotlight because they were home and they were looking for some connection. Uh, and so uh, because of that, uh, if they weren't a believer in public health or in the role of government, uh, then uh, I think that may have affected their, uh, their uh, interactions with us. Um, our agency uh, did receive a lot of, you know, angry phone calls. 17-minute um, voicemail tirades uh, and, uh, you know, anonymous hangups and, you know, those types of things. Um, there was a, a, a protest actually at our health department where uh, the protest had been instructed by the organizers to yell at our staff 
as they were coming out of their cars and walking into the building. Initially, I think the conversation was somewhat about obstructing them, but then I think they were talked to uh, by law enforcement that they weren't able to do that. Um, and so uh, there was uh, uh, definitely discussion about, uh, you know, encouraging them to yell and hurl insults essentially at our, at our staff as they walked from their cars into the building. Things like, you know, go back to your own country or other kind of demeaning um, or offensive comments that were really demoralizing. Uh, and, uh, you know, like I said, our team's been working around the clock um, and they've been doing so out of a love for their community. Uh, and so, so these types of things uh, really uh, made, a, made a difference. We did have lots of commentary made on social media platforms as well, like in response to newspaper articles or on other types of social media forums. Um, I, don't, I don't know if they uh, technically, technically meet the definition, the legal definitions of things like threats or harassment or whatever, but they definitely did set us on edge. Um, and, uh, you know, including there were suggestions to uh, cut the power lines and the telephone lines and internet at the health department, which, you know, at a time when we're the main vaccinators for the county and we're storing vaccine um, supply and including ultra cold, you know, Pfizer freezers, uh, that uh, was very concerning uh, about whether or not that was a, a legitimate thing or just like a keyboard warrior type of person. Um, there was an attempt by a store owner um, to block in. Uh, two of our environmental health inspectors when they were going on site uh, with his truck uh, and uh, as they were trying to leave. Um, and so that was uh, that was very disturbing as well. And, you know, again, all of this just set our agency team on edge and uh, depressed morale, I think, when we when we needed it most. Uh, people were anxious and um, they were scared. Uh, we even had a, a suspicious package. Uh, situation that came up. Fortunately, it turned out to be a kind of a situation of mistaken identity, uh, and it wasn't a, a, an actual um, delivered package, uh, but we did activate in response to it, um, as we have uh, trained to do, uh, because uh, until we figured out what the situation was, and uh, I know all of that you know, came about or was influenced by us uh, being stressed and on edge from everything else that was going on in the community. Um, just a, a couple of follow up questions. So some of those um, comments about going back to your country and some was that specific or personal? Was that to you or to members of your staff yeah. or both? Was it? It was probably to me. Um, I, yeah. I mean, I was born and raised here in the States, but obviously I'm, I'm of Indian heritage and sure. um, it, I think it was directed to me. There were there were definitely um, comments uh, about me personally. Uh, so what I went through was more like what was directed at our agency, but um, you know, again, there were there were things about me personally as well, um, uh, comments or um, situations that evolved. Uh, you know, again, I don't know if they meet the definition of threat, uh, but you know, there were comments about you know where I might live, um, you know, who my husband was, what he does, um, uh, protesting at my house, uh, throwing trash in my yard, you know, those types of things. Um, so mm -hmm. I think you know all of that. Uh, just again adds to added to a lot of the stress that we were experiencing. Sure. Um, there were comments about uh, my um, my name. Um, certainly, it's probably difficult to pronounce. Uh, even the nickname of Nina, uh, or it was unusual to some people, and so there was uh, kind of ongoing commentary about that. My Indian heritage, <laughs> even, uh, and uh, you know, I think it was kind of more like more like what you would think of as bullying, perhaps. And they're all like mostly anonymous on social media platforms. Um, so you know, who knows if it's one person or multiple people. Um, there, were, there were other statements made too. There was a comment about um, uh, effing me up uh, and uh, a comment about uh, doxing uh, me in particular. Uh, there was a, a film clip video posted, uh, a shooting video, a gun shooting video of somebody strung to a chair uh, and two people were shooting multiple rounds into that person, strung into the chair and, and killed the person. It was from a film, uh, from a movie. Uh, and it was uh, some comment, I can't remember the exact words, but something to the effect of um, this is what hap should happen to, this is what we should do to somebody who thinks they have authority in a conversation that was about me. Um, uh, there were, you know, like I said, uh, you know, comments about, uh, to organize protests at my house and dumping trash. <laughs> um, there were a few actual protests 
um, to fire me in particular um, at some of the you know very busy street corners um, in our community as well. Okay, well, thank you for sharing. Um, obviously, we really appreciate that, and we're all um, disheartened to hear some of what's happened to you. We know you're not alone. Know that doesn't make it better. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering, you, you kind of mentioned a few things about, I don't know if this meets the legal definition, um, and I can't say whether or not it, it would meet certain definitions in Maryland offhand, but were, other, were steps taken um, with law enforcement to speak with them? Um, I know you said with the suspicious package, you had to go through a certain number of, of steps, but were, were, um, was law enforcement involved? Yeah, um, so, you know, our, we, our law enforcement here, I mean, we're very fortunate. Um, we've got a, a fantastic working relationship with them, um, both our, our local sheriff's office and the Maryland State Police, which support our county as well. Uh, and uh, they've uh, been absolutely tremendous. They operate with very high integrity and um, are are on it. Uh, and so, yes, we, we certainly, uh, if we, if we ourselves ran across things that we thought were, might be of concern, we, we brought it to their attention and, and uh, I think they would do what they needed to do to look into things. Um, uh, we, you know, there, there were steps I took that, yeah, obviously, I mean, for those who uh, who are watching that are from public health, they could probably relate. You know, there's such a high level of, of stress during this pandemic response where you're constantly anticipating what the next move is of this of this virus uh, and what you need to do to prepare and, and there's a higher level perhaps of um, uh, you know feeling of, of need to prepare for a threat um, and so I think that translated probably to how I may have handled some of this personally and um, you know I, I sent my family away to another state for a, a week I have a couple of young children and so um, you know the when, when things got particularly intense with some of the commentary that was being made, um, I, I just made that decision for me. It was easier to know that they were safe uh, just in case, you know, something happened uh, than to have to stress about that as well. Um, you know, they did end up coming back. My kids were, were worried about, you know, missing Santa <laughs> if they weren't home. Uh, so they did end up coming back and it was fine. Uh, but, uh, you know, so those kind of things happened. Uh, but I uh, always did that in coordination with informing uh, law enforcement, I think, uh, you know, what was going on and, and uh, what my concerns were. And um, so what other legal resources were available to you aside from, you know, the communication and some assistance from law uh, local law enforcement? What other um, resources were there for you? Um, I, well, I mean, as you know, I, I reached out to you all. Right. Um, but, uh, I mean, the, the Legal Resource Center uh, for Public Health Policy uh, that you operate at University of Maryland is, has been a tremendous resource uh, for, for all of us in public health um, on many matters, but especially on this matter, you know, I've reached out to try to get a better understanding of the legal uh, parameters we're here. I uh, spoke with the uh, state's attorney general's office, uh, which uh, local health departments in Maryland uh, use uh, representation from the state's attorney general's office for different matters. Uh, so I did reach out to them and work with them and, um, you know, there was a, a court case involved in this uh, related to a, a facility that needed to be closed. Uh, and uh, so I was already working with them on, on those matters. So that, that kind of wrapped into this as well. And was there anything else that to add or, or say with respect to this situation? Any other kind of final thoughts or, or comments? Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, it's been an extraordinary year, and I know um, there's a lot of stress on everyone, right? I mean, not just us in public health, but our community, our community members, and um, not to explain away, you know, what was happening, but just to understand that that stress, I'm sure, was influencing some of the behavior that um, was uh, negatively impacting us or influencing us. I, I think um, it, it's hard to it's hard to go through. I, go through that type of um, activity, uh, both as an agency and uh, as, a, as a person um, at a time when you're really stressed and all your energy and time really is, is addressing the uh, safety of our whole community. Um, so I don't know that it necessarily uh, restricted uh, me or our health department from taking certain actions. 
um, it certainly uh, added to the heaviness um, on our minds uh, and, uh, you know, uh, certainly impacted us from that perspective. Well, I just I to say thank you so much um, for for your time for sharing sharing this um, such personal experiences too. Um, we're really grateful. I think it's invaluable to hear from you today, um, and so I I just can't can't thank you enough for being here and, and communicating with us. Um, I do want to turn things over to Beth and then back to Gabby so we can kind of generate a discussion surrounding um, all of all of what we've talked about here today. Thank you. Great. Um, well, thank you. And thank you, thank you, Dr. Brewster, for sharing it. As um, Brooke said, um, it's uh, hard to share those personal stories, and we really appreciate it, as well as all of your staff and all of the um, people. Uh, one thing that struck me was that you mentioned a lot about partnerships. Uh, um, and I wanted to maybe as we turn to thinking about how to advance going forward to help protect People, I'd like to say, oh, this is never going to happen again, but as we know, I don't think that's going to be the case. So I was wondering if you might want to share a little bit about your your partnerships and as well, you know, you mentioned there was an uh, effort to have you fired and obviously you're still here. Thank goodness. Um, if the, the your county elected officials supported you or what the response was there and again, thinking about how to move forward. Sure, sure. Um, thank you for that question. I, I think. Uh, Partnerships have been critical in the entire uh, COVID response and, and are continue to be as we continue to respond to COVID uh, and, and other public health matters. That's uh, it's something that because we have these strong partnerships already developed uh, prior pre COVID and then also uh, for the several months in the beginning of COVID, as we as an agency started to experience um, some of these uh, comments and you know uh, questionable threats uh, or or um, Things that could, you know, be be concerns uh, from a legal perspective. Uh, we we certainly had those open lines of communications already built uh, with law enforcement, with our uh, legal resources to uh, look into it. Uh, and so I think that made uh, a huge difference in in our level of comfort and knowing that um, that people with the the right level of uh, authority and expertise uh, were were on it and uh, and and allowed us to. Uh, while it was very heavy on our minds, it, it allowed us to continue operating uh, as we needed to operate. Um, in relation to uh, the local board of health um, here in Maryland, for the most part, as you know, the local boards of health are uh, primarily comprised of the local elected officials. Uh, and uh, they uh, were, I don't know that I, I publicly talked about this at all, um, you know, obviously, except for today, um, but uh, they, I think they, they were informed uh, periodically or uh, as, as things developed. I'm, I'm not sure what kind of detailed conversations happened with them about what was happening with our health department or me personally. Uh, but the, the protests to fire me were um, you know, pretty publicly organized. Uh, there were, I don't, I don't know that our uh, commissioners, I, I think our, our, our commissioners here, our board of health here has been fully supported, uh, fortunately. Fully supportive of our health department and the response um, that we've had, and like I said before, the majority of our community was was very fully supportive of the uh, response that we coordinated here and, and are coordinating here. So that's a great point. I think that often gets forgotten because um, media, and we're all guilty of this, right? We we're so horrified by the negative, and that's what we get drawn to, and that's what the headlines are. Um, so I think that is a good point, and I appreciate you sharing about the positive responses that you did get. I actually just heard a story that they're going to be naming a building in New Jersey in uh, Trenton after the health official. So, um, so I so I do think it is important for us to recognize that there has been a lot of support, and that is important. But on the flip side, obviously, these other types of behaviors are not acceptable, and we and we need to think about how how we can. Um, go forward. So I guess nobody wants to relive the last two years or a year and a half or so. But I guess Dr. Brewster, do you, would you share like if you if you could start again or like I guess in terms of and I would encourage our audience if you want to add into the chat about what would you what would be most helpful? I am I'm sure that Brooke and the network was very helpful, but going forward that you know that could have prevented some of this or or pre better prepared you all or any thoughts you have on 
what um, yeah. and my this is a little selfish because my team is actually going to try to start working on this. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on what might uh, what might be helpful. Yeah, um, that's a great question, and uh, you know, honestly, I haven't um, uh, really sat down and thought about it in depth. But what comes to mind, um, you know, in, in in terms of what would have been helpful for this particular behavior, in particular the the commentary and the, the protests and so forth. Um, I think it would have been helpful for me coming in to have a more comprehensive understanding of what the laws were and were not uh, on this matter. I mean, I feel like I'm much better informed now just because of the work um, that's been done through the Legal Research Center and then Johns Hopkins and others and just having to respond in these situations. But I think coming in to have a, a regular understanding or updated understanding, maybe even annually, of what laws there were and were not and what the limitations of those were um, would have been helpful. Um, two, uh, really understanding how, uh, what the response is. I mean, I, I don't know that I have the knowledge, you know, other than kind of peripherally, you know, when you set up, you send a patient or a client for um, uh, service leads, but I, I didn't really have the, the knowledge of how things work. So if you're, if you feel like you may be um, somebody who's received some kind of threat or whatever, uh, what happens? You know, what, where does that go? And what's the process of who's involved in looking into it and, and so forth? And what kind of security options are there and so forth? So that kind of information would be helpful. Um, the other uh, part, too, is, uh, you know, just from the perspective of being a leader, uh, how to uh, navigate that with your, with your agency, uh, with your team at a time when everyone is so... Um, overwhelmed with, uh, with responding to a crisis. Uh, and, and there's already that layer of uh, great stress uh, and frankly, trauma. Uh, to add on this additional layer, uh, how do you as a leader, uh, you know, what are, some, what are some things to consider as a leader? What are some things to uh, ease the situation, to provide reassurance, to be mindful of safety, all of that? Great. Well, thank you so much. That was uh, very helpful. Um, and I encourage our audience if there are other things that they're thinking about. Um, I appreciate Dr. Brewster. You not only did you highlight for yourself, but also for your staff. And as a, that's a true sign of a leader that you're thinking about not only yourself, but how do you then help um, your your workforce? So, so thank you for that. And uh, thank you for anyone listening that have uh, endured this year and are still here serving us. And uh, we really appreciate it. So I'm going to pass it back to uh, Kathy. Thank you, Beth. And thank you, uh, Mina and um, Brooke as well. Um, we did have a couple of questions come in, so I'm going to uh, throw them out and, you know, uh, you can decide, you know, whoever wants to answer or, or multiple people can answer. Um, the first um, was, and I, we know this happens, Brooke, we've talked about this. Um, what about when you're in a jurisdiction that might have some protective laws um, but you're not getting any cooperation from law enforcement or prosecutors. There is a negative relationship between um, the health department and health officials um, and law enforcement and prosecutors. Any thoughts or reactions to that? So I think the, the first element of, of this is if, you know, there are laws that exist, but the people who are responsible for and the only folks who can actually enforce them, um, they're, they're not going to be enforced. Um, and that's obviously the, the problem, the concern that you're raising. Um, I think what's really necessary and what's what we really need um, is to build or um, strengthen some of those relationships. Like, I think it would have to start there. Um, and whether that's meetings or and or conducting some type of education, um, getting creative to try to find a way to to bridge those gaps and find commonality is is one way. Um, and, and part of that goes to back to the need to invest in public health. Um, you know, we, I think Beth mentioned early on, she went through which states in the past 10 years have, um, you know, reduced public health funding. And I think that's a problem because we need education. We need these educational campaigns so that everyone, including law enforcement and, you know, all, all government agencies have a sense of what it is, what we do. Um, and, and why it's important, why it matters. So I think what it really comes back to is those two things. How can we strengthen those relationships? Might need to get creative if you don't have that fun that funding or money. And just another um, point of the need to invest in public health, um, invest 
financially, emotionally, really, and, and, and otherwise. So I don't know if Beth had anything specific she wanted to, to add to that, or if, if um, Dr. Brewster had any questions either, or any um, thoughts or comments. Uh, no, I think what you, you shared is true. You know, again, investing in public health and making it a priority before the, the crisis hits is, is the important part and, and having those relationships in place. Absolutely. Thanks. I, I just want to add to one possibility, um, and it really depends on your local jurisdiction. Oh, Mina, I probably cut you off. Go ahead. Did you have something to add? I, I was just going to concur and, and say, um, you know, we can really alleviate the stress of that early response. Um, to any uh, activation, uh, which, you know, serves as a, a, you know, already heightens the level of stress before you add on the stress related to something like what we've been talking about, um, just by uh, supporting that longer term public health infrastructure. Totally agree. Um, the, there is a strategy that may work in some um, jurisdictions, and it really depends on the setup between local law enforcement and state law enforcement. And if you are a state health official um, or if you're a local health, health official and it is state law that would be being violated, it is possible that the state uh, police could become engaged if local law enforcement doesn't. In most states, that's possible. Um, so uh, we could look at a particular state if somebody had a question about that. That's not optimal because we don't want law enforcement to have to be involved, generally speaking. But if you're in a sticky wicket, um, think about you know potentially engaging um, state law enforcement. The other thing I think is you know and uh, you're kicking off with talking about what we could do and what we could do better. A lot of the things that um, that Brooke referenced here um, is you know. You know, in my head, just thinking about having for every health local health department an assigned member um, of the local sheriff's department or the local police department assigned to be, you know, part of the health department, right? Not in enforcement capacity. I mean, we know you sometimes have to use law enforcement for enforcement um, work, but really as a liaison with the sheriff's office so they can become embedded with you, get to know the health officer, the deputy health officers, the staff there. Um, and I think um, that might move us toward um, a space where we can break down some of these barriers between law enforcement um, and public health. Another question. Um, it, uh, sadly, this person reports that they are in one of the 15 states that you identify, Brooke, without protective laws. Um, there has been a campaign launched there um, against a local public health, um, principally by parents in the community, um, called Free Our Children, Free the Mask. Um, it's an email campaign against the, against the health officer that's engaged in massive quantities of emails, just like just daily, hourly coming in, you know, so much that it is actually overwhelming staff. And I know Mina spoke to some of that um, uh, stuff that was overwhelming staff and interfering with their ability to actually do their job. So the, the question is really, would that constitute interference um, with duties? Um, and are there any federal provisions that folks could look to that might help in these circumstances? All right, so the, to uh, address the first part of the question. So every state, um, and I, like I mentioned briefly, and I didn't get into this in any, any level of detail, but every state has, you know, criminal laws that could potentially apply. And so some of those um, might be things like stalking or harassment, that type of thing. So depending on the content in the emails, the number of emails, I mean, these would probably be evidentiary um, questions. It's possible that those, that behavior, that I mean, Kathy described it sounded pretty egregious here. The number of emails, maybe not at, not saying anything substantive, um, potentially could constitute harassment. Generally, in state statutes, you have to put the harasser on notice and say, "Please do not contact me again. This is not for a legal purpose, et cetera, et cetera." There's usually something, some kind of notice requirement, but it's possible that they could, um, it would fall under that. It would depend on the state and the, the language of of the statute, um, and so. There are, even if you're not one of those states, there are laws that could potentially exist. Um, and as far as federal protections, so if um, you are going to look at the federal government protecting you, it has to be that a federal agent or federal actor is the one who enforces it. And my sense is that they would not pick up um, that kind of case. So even if there was a provision that was spot on, and off the top of my head, I don't know that, that there is specifically aside from the general um, yeah, I mean, I wonder if there's like stalking. misuse of computer or any of those. Yeah, like there, there might be some space, but I've heard of those, you know, provisions. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and that's for the state that your state likely has a misuse of computer. Most states have something like that too. I meant to mention that one. Um, 
but I doubt that the federal government would pursue that kind of um, case. Generally speaking, they like to cherry pick their cases. They like they they know they're going to win. They get to pick them. Um, and if this wasn't clear and it wasn't something that was um, just extremely egregious, they might not take it. Not to say never, but I think it would be unlikely. So I would suggest meeting with um, you know a, a prosecutor if you have a partner in that office and just combing through what the possibilities are. Or of course, reach out to us at the network. I mean, that's what we did with. Dr. Brewster and I can help comb through the code and see what I think might have potential um, to apply or just what laws exist that are related. Beth? Yeah, so I guess I wanna add on another question is, um, cause this came up with some, uh, when we were talking with law enforcement, if, um, and Dr. Brewster mentioned things about her origins and people saying going back to your own country, can those fall under hate crimes? or racial type crimes, and is that another, and that's a different statute, correct? Yeah, given that typically, I think, Brooke, am I stepping on your toes? Okay. <laughs> when your boss says, starts talking and you don't want to interrupt her, um, I, I think typically those in, involve um, more uh, physical action, right? So there are, you know, to the extent that there are hate crime laws, which, you know, I think virtually every state and the federal government does have them, it's, um, it, it usually is just an increase in penalties for something that was already a crime. So assault is a crime, assaulting someone because they are of a certain race, gender, sex, you know, uh, religion, et cetera, um, you know, can be an add on to the sentence an enhanced sentence. Um, so I'm not sure that given the types of this implicit threat stuff um, that we really have those statutes that would do the add on. Um, or the racial animus or um, gender animus or, or what, have, what have you. It's a great question and it's a way to look at those laws to see is there a way to, to modify them um, in some respects. I, I, there's another question I want to ask actually to you, Beth. So fair, turn about Sarah Kelly here now, right? Um, moving forward, right? Because that's what we're talking about now. Um, you know, what's done is done and it's horrible and it's going to take time um, and lots of work for us to, you know, for public health officials to recover from it. Um, but strategically moving forward in states or local jurisdictions that are advocating for um, state level uh, protections for themselves. Do you think there's a strategic difference between seeking protection specifically for public health officials and their employees versus seeking protections for all public employees? Because we often hear, well, same thing happened to, you know, I don't know, you know, the Department of Environment when they were, you know, shutting down this, you know, plant that people wanted to, you know, stay operational, but it was spewing, you know, uh, chemicals. So thoughts on that strategically. Yeah, and that's a good point because I think as Brooke mentioned a little bit about election officials, um, and I know also school officials, right? So there's been many pushbacks against government overall. So you know, I don't have the the training that you all do in terms of the legal aspects, but from just a common sense perspective, it seems to me if we broaden and think about government officials overall, then you can be building allies as you're as you're going, right? So you and thinking about um, I mean, clearly there's some specific things around public health, right? A threat of life or health, you know, you're trying to protect someone's health. So maybe that is a part of the piece of it, but it seems to me if we could think broadly about governmental officials overall, that that might have a better um, chance of success in terms of allyship and um, and uh, building constituencies across. So even if someone wasn't necessarily so engaged on public health, they really cared about elections or the school system employees. Um, and generally just in, in our perspective around public service, right? I mean, it's just not acceptable the way public servants are being treated in whatever um, arena they're working in. I don't know if Dr. Brewster would have any other ad, uh, thoughts on those on that question. No additional thoughts, but uh, I agree with what you were saying, Sean. Brooke, anything to add there? Um, no, I don't know that I have uh, anything to add, Beth. I do think those are some good points that you made, though. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. And I think, you know, on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis, you identify the partners that are going to bring strength to your, you know, Sadly, local public health officials generally don't have a lot of political power, right? Um, but county executives do and county council people often do and, you know, and, and others. And so finding those partners um, that can strengthen the argument might be um, what it takes in some jurisdictions. Um, uh, 
just a quick question um, that actually I'm, I'm going to answer because the person submitted it with their um, registration. Um, I think it's kind of outside the, the, what we're talking about, but I want to let them know to contact the network directly, contact us. It's totally fine. Wherever you are, you can contact um, the Eastern Region and we'll get you to the right folks. But it's how do you build support with elected leaders and legal counsel to do enforcement of environmental health laws, i.e. food safety, solid waste, groundwater. In some cases, there may be a need to de actually develop state or local codes and are there models available? Um, the answer is, you know, we can help with that. And yes, there are models available in, in different spaces. And so uh, please reach out to us um, directly on that particular question. So, and I think now we're gonna look at enforcement differently um, moving forward, given what we've learned about um, when local uh, public health um, acts and in light of this, the legislation that's been at least proposed and in some cases passed to retract enforcement power away, to take it away from local public health officials. And so if you're interested in that space, maybe you're interested in helping to preserve um, local public health powers. We're bumping up against the, um, the end of the um, meeting, but I just wanted to ask um, if Brooke, Mina, or um, uh, Beth had anything uh, last to say before I turn it back to Charles for wrapping up. So I just wanted to say, um, first of all, thank you all for hosting this. It's really been a great conversation. And, and again, to Dr. Brewster for sharing your, your stories and, and all of your work. I think there's a, a, a um, opportunity here that we, we need to grasp onto in terms of an interest and an understanding and an appreciation for the importance of this, obviously, right now is our, our window. I think I know we have heard from law enforcement nationally in the um, FBI and some other places, ASCO and NATO are very interested in this topic. We're, we're gonna be presenting this summer to the um, uh, National Association of Local Boards of Health. So even though there is a lot of pushback on the other side where people are trying to reduce authority, I think there's also a lot of interest in trying to support public servants broadly and public health specifically. So. Um, if people have other ideas about that, I would love to hear from you and I appreciate you guys hosting this. Um, oh, and we're also gonna be talking about this at the NATO annual meeting coming up. So there's definitely a movement afoot and, and we need to build on that. I would um, I would add to, uh, if, if anyone is experiencing, uh, you know, either the, the types of things I was describing or things that seem you know, more serious, like the ones that were described for uh, health officials across the country, uh, I connect with your other your your network. Connect with other health officers or public health officials in your state. Uh, your uh, state association of uh, county and city health officers is a great resource, and hopefully, your state has a strong state chapter. Uh, uh, and uh, I I can tell you like that that through this whole pandemic that has been my um, that group of of wonderful people have been my sounding board. Uh, and and really, my moral support are um, uh, state, um, you know, Maryland Association of uh, County Health Officers. And I, I would add that so this situation it, it continues to to evolve. Um, what we know as far as you know the type of information that that Beth is tracking. Um, and, and on our end, what laws might be introduced, and um, maybe we'll see some some enforcement, some uh, prosecutions throughout the country. So we're tracking this very carefully. This is not going away. It's, I think um, some of this anti-government sentiment has been there. I think the pandemic has kind of brought out the worst in some people, maybe the best in others, um, but this isn't going away and, and we're, we're gonna continue um, to track this and you'll probably continue hearing from us over the next year or so with some, some old information and some new. So thank you so much. Um, uh, to Beth and, and to Mina and of course to Kathy for moderating, but for being here today and, and caring about these issues and continuing to do such important um, work. Thanks, Charles. Thank you all. Um, and thank you, especially to our great speakers for your insights today. Uh, just a few final notes. Um, all attendees will be receiving an email from the network with the materials from this webinar as well as a link to our brief webinar survey. Uh, it takes just one minute to fill out and provides us with some really great insights. And finally, join us for the 2021 Public Health Law Conference this September in Baltimore. Um, we plan to host the conference in person with a hybrid component, um, but we will be providing updates to our registrants with developments on the conference. So that concludes today's webinar. Thank you all for attending and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.